Namaste. I got an email yesterday from one of our viewers who always asks really good questions. And he came up with a very essential point that I think it's valuable to discuss. Anyway, he writes, Namaste, Swamiji. I have difficulty understanding the relationship between karma and awareness of the true self. Since the student who works in the daily tasks of his life knows that he is not the one who works, how then can karma exist? Said schematically, it's not me, it's him. Therefore, I am not responsible for my actions since I am not that but the self. I understand that this can quickly become an excuse to absolve oneself of one's responsibilities in a bad interpretation of sacred texts. Yes, and the Neo-Advaitans do it all the time. <laughs> but let's go back. In the Vedas, there are two paths, the path of action and the path of knowledge. And nowhere is this more, how can I say, striking than in Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is about a man of action, Arjuna, the warrior king. And Krishna is telling him that it's your duty, you have to fight. But at the same time, Krishna is also telling him you're not this body and mind. You're not this karmic being. You are the self beyond all actions. And so Arjuna gets confused. He gets perplexed. And he asks Krishna, now, will you tell me clearly which one of these paths is the right one? Knowledge or action? You talk about doing the right thing in the world, doing your duty and such, and then you go on and talk about, like, knowledge being the ultimate thing. Well, which is it? The Rastafarians talk about this. They say, I and I. Meaning, capital I and lowercase i. <laughs> the Supreme Self, Brahman, and the small self, the individual self. So this is a problem, even for great scholars. In the process of preparing our next series, I was looking through a translation of one of the Upanishads, and the translator was saying in the introduction, it's a lot of work to distinguish between when the small I is meant and the large I. Why is that? because it's the same word also in Sanskrit, Atma. Depending on the context, Atma can mean the body, the individual soul, or the supreme soul. So it's a problem even for great scholars and translators of Sanskrit literatures to discern which one is which. And of course, if you know the philosophy or if you have done extensive meditations, it's easy. The small self is the one who works and is subject to karma. And the big self with the capital S is only the watcher, the knower, not the doer. And so he is not subject to karma because he actually never takes birth. He is always transcendental. The one who takes birth is the small I, the individual self, and he's the one who is subject to karma. Because what is karma? How does karma work? We've been over this a bunch of times on this channel. It is the sum total of the impressions of one's previous lives, which you carry with you from body to body, 
in seed form. And they form the basis of the next body at the close of life. So what this means is that it's not that there's some, you know, angel somewhere with a big record book writing down everything that we do. <laughs> no, we ourselves are the agent of karma, the small self, <laughs> because the records of karma are carried with the body with the soul from body to body, I should say. So they are actually part of the body, being the seed or origin of the body. But the big self, the <laughs> capital S self, is beyond all that. That self never takes birth, never dies, never changes. I mean, you can check this in yourself. There are the three lower states of conditioned consciousness. Jagrat, or external sense consciousness. Svapna, or internal sense consciousness, like in dreams or in imagination, thinking. And then there's sushupti, deep sleep consciousness, where there is awareness, but no objects. Above and beyond all these is Turiya, which is simply pure awareness of awareness, consciousness of consciousness. So we are conscious that we are conscious, is it not? You ask anybody, do you exist? Are you conscious? Of course, they're going to say yes. But they might have trouble explaining how they know this. <laughs> because Turiya is not well known. It is the consciousness that has the other states of consciousness as its object. So when you are aware in Turiya, which is all the time, the other states of consciousness come and go, but Turiya remains. So you can check this in yourself. Look within yourself and observe which states of consciousness are active? And you'll find that Jagrat or external sense consciousness and Svapna or internal sense consciousness can be active at the same time, and they often are. Like you can be doing something and thinking about what happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, or you can be asleep and dreaming, and then something happens externally, there's a loud sound or something, and you wake up. And for a moment, you're poised in between the two states, isn't it? This happens to everyone. So in that moment, you are neither in internal nor external consciousness fully. Then you can look through both of them and realize that, I am the watcher, I am the witness, I am Turiya, I am Brahman. So as long as we exist in the material world, we have these two states of consciousness, these two selves, one subject to karma, who is the doer and the receiver of the results of action, and the other, who is simply the witness, the non-doer, he who simply exists. That is the big self, <laughs> self with a capital S. And the small self is the one who is subject to karma. So now does that mean that we can do anything we want without any restrictions? That's the way the Neo-Advaitans take it. But how does Krishna advise Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita? He says, even though you know that you are not the doer and that you are not subject to karma, you still have to do your duty. Huh? Why? 
as an example to others to show them the right way of living. Now for Arjuna, this meant fighting a war because he was a kshatriya, he was a warrior, he was a king, and that, that was his duty. For people like myself, it means spreading the knowledge, helping others to understand and guiding them to realize the spiritual truths. For others, it may be uh, taking care of the family or even taking care of oneself or doing one's job nicely. I mean, it just depends on your social situation. So this discrimination between the great self, the Brahman, and the individual self, the small self, the individual uh, jiva, the one who is born, is probably, I would say, the fundamental distinction of spiritual realization. And scriptures like Drig Drishi Vivekaha, which we did a series on some time ago, point out this difference and explain it in detail so that we can realize it for ourselves through self-observation. Um, this is the exercise. This is the uh, awareness that we need to cultivate and develop so that we can remain clear on who is I and who is I. <laughs> who is the big I, the main existence, uh, the consciousness underneath it all, and who is the small self, the actor in the world, mainly identified with the body and so on, and subject to karma. We have to know both of these, and we have to act in such a way that we remain free from confusing one from the other. And in that way, we can attain self-realization and become free. Aung Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum Aum Namah Shivaya